So I appreciate the chance to talk with you all this morning. Um, this may be someone of Jewish heritage. It feels a little bit funny to be standing up here on a Sunday morning. Uh, but we'll see how this goes. I, um, you know, in, in a way to, uh, maybe it's just that we're closest to God up at this altitude. Maybe that's a little bit of it here. Um, just to honor Steve Schneider a bit, I, I do want to say, I think it's worth mentioning that I really appreciate just looking around at some of the folks here. Um, Adriana Bailey in particular is a graduate student at CU Boulder. Um, these kinds of interactions, I think, really inspire me and encourage me in terms of moving forward with these kinds of challenges. I think, as Spencer had rightly pointed out, the previously fragmented nature of, of these pursuits um, is part of our history, of course, but I think, you know, part of the title deliberately is looking to the future as well. And looking to the future, I, I'm encouraged by uh, looking around here. Steve Schneider um, actually had reached out to me, oddly enough, when he was giving a talk at the University of California, Santa Cruz in the early 2000s. I had written a paper with my brother, Jules Boykoff, at that time, um, looking at the journalistic norm balanced reporting and how that had been applied to coverage of human contributions to climate change. And we had found that there was this significant uh, informational bias that was being perpetrated through the press. And this is something that I think many of us in this room were already on to. We just ended up developing the methods to empirically test this hypothesis. And Steve Schneider was giving a talk to a, a packed house, as was the norm uh, for all of his talks. And he was just talking and he said, you know, and then there's this new paper. And it's from one of you out there. It's from one of you. Who is it? And I thought, oh my god, is he talking about me? And uh, that was his way of, you know, I know there were so many behind the scenes moments, and, and uh, I'm sure everybody could get up here and talk about those. But for me, I found it to be a really early uh, positive impression about how senior scientists can be taking the time like you all are taking to work with younger scholars as we move forward with this. It certainly is a generational project. So you can see that I've hijacked my time. Officially, originally, Mike Lemonick was asked to come speak. Um, and uh, he wasn't able to be here. And I, I am happy to talk about a history of climate communication through mass media. I actually have done this in a book that's partly dedicated to Steve Schneider. Um, but I would like to talk in terms of moving forward, maybe complementing the other two talks that have been uh, uh, presented here this morning by Mike and Spencer, just to look towards the future a bit. This is a project called Inside the Greenhouse that I'm engaged in at CU Boulder with uh, professor in ecology and evolutionary biology, Becca Safran, another professor in uh, humanities and theater and dance, Beth Osnes. And we're working with students to help create the conditions for them to uh, creatively communicate about climate change. And I find that also quite encouraging. So I'll work through some of the um, ways to set us up to get to that point. But ultimately, that's kind of the larger uh, that's where I'm going with this during my period of time here. So to start and to get into that, climate change is certainly one case study in some of the larger challenges that we face in these contentious spaces of culture and politics. And this, this really gets us into many questions that we face all the time about what is, what ought to be, these normative undertones, what are necessary and what are suffi sufficient conditions for changing the spectrum of possibility around attitudes, intentions, beliefs, perspectives, behaviors uh, regarding climate change and other uh, environmental issues. I draw myself on a lot of STS literature, um, maybe not as much as I want to yet, but Brian Wynn is an important scholar within STS, Science and Technology Studies. And he talks about how the deficit model is dead. Long live the deficit model. If this is a familiar sort of statement uh, to many of you, I think that's a good thing. But as we reach outside of this room into these wider publics as they are, that this deficit model, that if we can just hit, the, hit people over the head with the science, give them the right information, they will make the right decision, is a pervasive and ongoing challenge. This can be evidenced in a variety of uh, other issues. I pulled this out from the blaze. Um, which is uh, part of that Glenn Beck enterprise that's coming back, like the Phoenix Rising. But the Blaze uh, had quoted paleoanthropologist um, Richard Leakey and talking about, he said that, that 
if you get to the stage where you can persuade people on the evidence that it's solid and so forth, that we can, I think we have a chance that the world will respond better to global challenges. I think ultimately where I want to go with my comments here is to say this is all well and good, but this is not sufficient, that this is only part of the challenge, and that we need to smarten up our considerations here to not wait for this magical moment in order to move forward as a community. And I know many of you are working on these kinds of issues already. I rely also quite a lot on colleague and friend of many of you too, Susie Mosier, who talks about providing information and fill, filling knowledge gaps is at best necessary but rarely sufficient to create active behavioral engagement. The role that I've chosen to take up is not to prescribe any particular type of behavioral engagement per se, but rather to work through and analyze the spectrum of these possibilities for engagement. So getting into climate change, I also want to dig in maybe a little bit to the history in that I think Granger Morgan's take on this with colleagues back in the late 90s was quite useful. Um, and this has been reformulated in a variety of ways and tested. Dan Kahan has, has in particular done a lot of good work, Tony Leiserowitz, to point out three basic things that climate change suffers in terms of a public engagement issue from three main elements. One is that it's a long-term challenge, the time required to deal, to address this, talk about residence time in the atmosphere and so forth, uh, changing large systems that, that make up our uh, interactions, our daily lives, is a great challenge. The cultural distance, the negotiations once you enter into the political arena, through the Conference of Parties negotiations and so forth, even between scientists and the IPCC, is a big challenge. If only we could just deal with the people in this room, sort it all out. It's not that easy. And then finally, the resources required at stake. That This cuts to the heart of the way that we're living our lives. All work against this as an issue. And so as we emanate out, the domain of most climate-related policy problems is out there in this diffuse distant place. And I know in talking with some of you that many of you are working to localize this, make it meaningful uh, in the places where people are. And that's also part of what I take up in my work as well. I, Mike Hume has many good takes on the, his book, Why We Disagree About Climate Change. Uh, among them is that we need to stop viewing climate change as another opportunity just to apply the existing toolkit. And I think I'm speaking to a group that's onto this, but I hopefully just use this time wisely in, in providing a few reminders about this moving forward. Um, and I, when we passed 400 parts per million collectively, I can say we, uh, this made the, the uh, front page thought of the New York Times on that particular day. Uh, but as evidenced, on that particular day, just about a month ago, this also fought for coverage with a lot of more uh, uh, intense and specific, uh, not diffuse issues, such as Benghazi emails, um, the Bangladesh disaster, the, uh, the workers. Uh, and so there are many of these challenges that we're facing all the time in making a diffuse issue like this a long-term challenge, uh, meaningful in the immediate. And this is just part of the problem. Uh, part of the challenge. So when I take up a lot of the work that I do, both through qualitative and quantitative work, I look at the role of the media as a bridge between these maybe more insular spaces of climate science and policy and then people's everyday lives, simply. And so I've um, leaned on this quote. We can think about how we wake up in the morning and probably tune into different forms of media before we're dipping into the peer-reviewed literature. There probably are exceptions in this room. But for the most part, Mass media is that means of public communication that reaches out to that larger audience. As Steve Schneider had said, and Spencer Wirt had, had quoted, that to reach this large audience, to make a difference, one must go through uh, mass media, for better or worse. So there are different forms of mass media over time. There's traditional legacy media. You can think about broadcast television, print journalism, which is giving way uh, in a variety of ways in uh, different demographics to new and social media. There's also news media, the straight up news media, maybe the Sunday talk shows, the evening broadcasts that are giving way to entertainment. Maybe this is my version of pure entertainment, the voice. Uh, but then there's a lot of crossovers, infotainment into uh, entertainment as a guise, maybe as a cloak through Bill Maher, The Daily Show, and Stephen Colbert. 
um, some really interesting work on how Stephen Colbert can shepherd in for a lot of people, a lot of younger people in particular, a great deal of news and information. Uh, and people of the ideological right think that he's uh, with them. People of the ideological left think that he's with them as well. And it's quite a genius way and part of the changing role of media over time. So to get into the questions around climate change, one of the things that I do with my grad group and others within series where I am uh, based at the University of Colorado is we just simply start by tracking and monitoring uh, news coverage of climate change around the world. And so we update this each month, and you can go to this web page uh, and see the ebbs and flows over time. We do this also at the country level across eight countries now. This is the United States. Uh, the way that this breaks down. And I'm guessing that as you look into this as well, I'm assuming I think a fair bit just to keep moving, but you can probably look to, to these ebbs and flows and think about a number of different events that were taking place during this time. I think just the one that I want to pick out right here, end of 2012, can people think about what had contributed to that spike in coverage at that time? Sandy, right. That provided a big news hook at that point. And during that period of time, I pulled this off the climate wire. This is one of many statements that was made, hooking in cl Sandy to climate, uh, cl in this case, climate skepticism, climate action. And Senate Democrats believed that Superstorm Sandy would be that turning point. Uh, and I think that we heard that quite a lot. One of the arguments, or one of the points that I want to make here is just to say that I think if we're looking for that turning point through Hurricane Sandy, I think that that's a false uh, you know, a flawed way of looking at this. The work that I've done tracking this historically over time has really looked at concatenate influences, the simultaneity of looking at political events, political developments paired with scientific advancements, be it AR5 coming out, uh, the National Academy of Sciences report, and uh, ecological and meteorological as well as cultural events themselves. And together it's those that have proven to provide, that have proven to have more of a sustained uh, element of coverage. And now this is just talking all about quantity here, really. Uh, and you know, a lot of the work that I do that I value most is what gets into the quality of the how and the why around coverage. But this is, I think, a useful first way in. From Hurricane Sandy, for those of you who live in the East Coast, I think perhaps it is, remains meaningful and enduring. But I think as you go across the country to other places, Hurricane Sandy remained another blip as we move on and go forward. So to get into, maybe this is my gesture towards the historical. On the top, you've got the IPCC assessment of paired anthropogenic uh, contributions with natural variation. You can see the dramatic increase in media coverage of climate change in recent years. And this was documented somewhat Mike McCracken and Spencer both brought this up. I, I do want to go from that just to talking about those resonant themes to then, with my time, talk about this project as a way that people are, younger people in particular, are drawing on some of these resonant themes, bringing them together to try and engage different publics in this way. And it, it draws for me on, I think I've pointed out four or five here, just ongoing formidable challenges before I get into this. First is this notion of participatory and comparative studies across place, context, and time. I kind of actually grouped a number of challenges in right there. One is to help empower people to find their place within this in different places, in different contexts, and then to be examining this across places and over time as well is a big challenge. And this is one of the challenges that, that we face. I've ended up gravitating towards social science inquiries in these areas. And so these are part of the challenges that many of us are taking up now. And then secondly, critical and analytical work on this mix of expertise and authority. So this can cut both ways, certainly does cut both ways, but how one's expertise can be challenged in the public arena in this court of public opinion. You know, Stephen Schneider talked a lot about the courtroom epistemology, meeting this meritocracy of good science. And so this is one of the challenges once you get into the public arena. You can think about this through peer-reviewed work. You can think about this through Steve Gorham's uh, new book, which was I actually had learned 100,000 copies sent out. So if you got a copy, you're one of the lucky 100,000 recipients. And Steve, if he were standing on this stage, he would charge $5,000 for for a speech. So it's a, you know it's part of this uh, 
part of this challenging and, and negotiation of expertise and authority. Third, navigation through these different ways of knowing. So we have and we value and certainly engage in scientific, research, academic ways of knowing, but we need to understand this as it complements and works in tandem with observation and experiential access. Um, so to get through, these are the last two, just engagement with new and social media, and that's part of this project with the students, and then mobilizing metaphors and analogies. Uh, Spencer had talked about the hockey stick. This is really a, an analogy, a metaphor that gets at trying to describe this increase. And so working, you know, we've got the bathtub effect and many different ways of providing these hooks. So to get into the project, inside the greenhouse is a deliberative experimental space, a living laboratory that we're working on developing and creating at the University of Colorado so that we can create these conditions so that students can try to address and communicate these different strategies. There are many of us involved. I mentioned Beth and Becca. Tom Yalsman is another person that you all may know who's involved in the project as well. Ryan Vachon, Josh Rollins, and Marissa McNatt. And we have developed now two university courses. Becca is teaching one in ecology and evolutionary biology, looking at focusing on film. Beth and I are focusing on what Beth is teaching me as multimodal forms of engagement. So public art, uh, performance, flash mobs, uh, children's storybooks, all sorts of artifacts. We also have paired this, you can, we think about this in three parts. The second, so we've got coursework. The second part are public events. In April, we had our first public event, which was highly successful, I believe, uh, and, and the feedback that we've gotten, the assessments that we've done, where we brought in James Baylog to talk about the art of chasing ice. And it wasn't an exercise in setting James Baylog on stage and saying, isn't James Baylog fantastic? Isn't he wonderful? Isn't this film great? It was actually to interrogate him a bit about what were his motivations, what was he trying to achieve, what was his perceived audience, and I think it was a very productive um, event. It's modeled in part from the Inside the Actors Studio, the James Lipton-led Pace University project that's been successful over the years, and we're thinking about doing this, so beware, we may be inviting uh, many of you in in the years to come. We do have Bill McKibben coming in in October as well. The third of the three parts that I refer to is that we're developing a, a program where we pull in the student work and we pull in uh, these onstage interviews. We had 1,500 people in Mackey Auditorium in Boulder, and we're hoping to take that event and then bridge it into some of these programs that will be airing um, in the years to come. So two events per year is our capacity at this stage. So that's inside the greenhouse. Just to focus on the student work. Am I doing okay on time? Okay. So to focus on the student work itself, part of our maturation, uh, at least through our first cut in spring of 2012 when we, caught, when we taught this, was to develop compositions along these three lines. The first was to ask students to try and put together a composition about something that you can do to address climate change, deliberately vague yet directed uh, in that way. Second, to reach beyond the individual to the collective. So um, I'll, I'll say more about this in a minute. And then third, to consider varied audiences and then meet them there. Thinking about how this audience, for example, is, is quite different from, say, uh, the hunters that are out right now or uh, Latino youth or other audiences. And I bring up those two as I'll provide some examples in a moment. So the first one, things that you can do about climate change. And we can think about maybe this as a collective maturation. We are condensed into this one semester and we have many ideas. We're going to be working with mechanical engineering in our next cut to develop um, some dioramas and different uh, models to depict these things. But in the first, we just said something you can do to address climate change. We have all these tools available uh, and many of them produced videos about individual superheroes saving the world. We had many dealing with individual consumer issues. We had many saying, you know, take fewer showers. I could show you three videos from the group that were running around turning people's showers off or turning down the heat and this sort of thing. This is logical in a sense, that this is part of how people get into, find resonance with these issues. I'm not going to show you examples of those. I think that was part of, you know, a rough cut, a first cut. The second part, I think I found, we found in our course, Beth and I, found to be um, challenging them further. They stepped outside 
of just videoing each other, going around town doing those things, uh, and developed like stop motion video, and developed, I'm forgetting this technique, that RSA in the UK, uh, no, it's like a drawing, they speed it up, I can't remember what the term is for that, uh, but a fossil food and drawing in the larger scale implications of our local food shed choices was quite effective. I, with extra time, I'm happy to show those too. But this gets us into the collectives. I want to show you just an exam two examples maybe of these last ones. Consider the very varied audiences. Another benefit that we had, Josh Rollins, who I just quickly referred to, he's somebody who's been an actor, he's a screenwriter, highly successful in the real world as it is. Um, and he was our teaching assistant for the course. He helped us develop a rigorous pitch and feedback process. And we also developed focus groups where students put together rough cuts, pitched it to us, put them together, and then went out and presented them to their perceived audiences, got feedback, oftentimes actually dramatically had to rework based on that feedback into these final uh, projects. And so this is speaking out to very different audiences. One is the hunters. Uh, the second is K-12, focusing on kids say climate things, kind of working through how kids perceive these changing uh, issues. And then El Verde, which is this persona that a number of students had put together, a Latino youth environmentalist, kind of a, a hardcore environmentalist in the ways in which he was uh, expressing himself that way. So all of these, by the way, I want to show two if I have time. I've got five minutes. I think I can do that. Um, and all of these are available over at this website that we've put together inside the greenhouse. Um, so I encourage you to check out more of them there. So I'm going to show you, I'll start with the Enviro Hunterists project. Is muted? Here we go. You know, discharging a firearm is a lot of fun. Started hunting when I was a boy. My father taught me, his father taught him, and we've been a family of hunters for generations and generations. I believe hunting is a privilege, it's not a right. We respect the animals that you harvest, and you consume the animals that you harvest. It's a very important part of hunting and celebrating those animals you harvest, celebrating their life by making them part of you and your life. You know, about 22 years ago, I shot my first elk. It was a beautiful six by six bull. We were hunting up by Kremlin, just south of Rabbit Ears Pass. And the season was 10 days long that, that year. And the last morning, I came into a quakey clearing and there was this bull standing sideways. And I shot him in the neck and knocked him down. And as I got down to the animal, he, he expired. And it was extremely touching. And I gave thanks. And that was about 8.30 in the morning. And we packed him out and it was about 10:30 at night and I couldn't see wasting that animal in the head and so I did have it mounted and it hangs on my living room wall and every day I get to look at that that beautiful creature and remember the time that I was blessed to harvest an animal like that you know in the last couple of years the weather's been awfully strange Two years ago, we had a hundred year winter event. The snow and the drifts on the eastern plains when we were out pheasant hunting were 10, 12 feet high, the highest I've ever seen them. And that was hard on those animals. I'm not sure why I'm seeing such swings in the environment and the weather. My name is Emily. I'm an environmental studies major. Even in the four years that I've been at CU, I've noticed lots of changes in our little community. 
the climate seems to be changing and not just because I've been learning about it but because it's actually happening. I live in a place where there's just a lot of discussion and a lot of conversation about what's going on with the environment but the thing is that I don't really see a lot of people actually doing anything. There's no action being taken and that's a problem. I think the people that are most connected to the environment are the ones that are actually outside living in the environment. You know, the people that spend a lot of time outdoors hiking or climbing or even hunting. We have to fuse together the knowledge that they have and the knowledge that we have to take action against the problems that are affecting our planet. Hunters are conservationists. Hunters are conservative. Uh, uh, like my daughter, who's uh, an environmental studies major at Colorado University. And this is her. And I'm very proud of her studies. And she's going to go on to do great things for the environment and conservation and she'll enjoy hunting with me in the future along with her younger brothers. The gun enthusiasts like there you could I welcome you to watch the final minute of it or so. Um, I'm gonna show one other one briefly and then I'll stop because I wanna make sure I'm respecting your time too. So here's El Verde, a very different audience, perceived audience. Soy el voz del medio ambiente. Me llamo el verde. Con poco suerte, la salud del mundo ya no está muerte. No soy de la calle, soy de la tierra. Y tengo mensaje cuando vayas afuera. Fresca. Esta es mi primera canción, respecto a tu madre. Su madre es el mundo. ¿Por qué compras mucho? No es suficiente. Cosas inútiles y demasiado gente. Respecta a tu madre. Respecta a tu madre. Respecta a tu madre. La próxima canción que necesitas oír se llama Thank you. It's important to uh, think about this in terms of smartening up rather than dumbing down communications. I think that's part of our shared challenge going forward. Um, and considerations for me, I've gravitated towards this work in that I think it is as important as these formal uh, climate governance architectures themselves to long-term success and failure in environmental decision making and everyday decision making. So I can sense it and I thank you and I'm happy to talk with folks uh, later as well.